So it's kind of awkward uh, that I have to keep using the corpse of my starter because that's my only Pokemon with headbutt. And I think this is um, okay for gameplay purposes in the Nuzlocke, but it is weird that I just have to keep going back to the Pokemon Center into the grave. You know, in traditional Nuzlocke rules, you're supposed to release Pokemon uh, when they faint in battle because they're dead. But um, I very much do prefer the more tradition, the more common way to do it, how I do it, not deleting them, just putting them in a box and calling it grave. So you can look back and, ah, I've lost all these Pokemon thus far. And I really hate the headbuck mechanics in this game. It's really unintuitive and dumb. At least it's better than the honey trees. Like, Gen 4 had some bad catching mechanics. And to, to be fair, there's also, like, Feebas in Gen 3. It's not like this is the only game with the kind of weird catching mechanics. Whatever. Can you kill? <sighs> so what's going on now? Well, there's a fucking thunderstorm going on outside. I think it's calmed down a bit that I shouldn't get any loud thunderclaps while I'm recording this, but I'm not positive, so that might happen. And, you know, I don't want a ladybug. I already got a ladybug. It's useless. Um, and the problem with this bad weather is it just, it just fucks me up. It, like, the pressure, it gives me a migraine. Like, I've had to deal with migraine throughout my whole life, and it's just the worst. They're easily set off from stress, or lack of sleep, or flashing lights, or pressure, and just, yeah, I felt like shit all day. But fortunately, as I've become an adult, I've discovered my new best friend, acetaminophen. Sweet, sweet drugs. It's a good thing I don't uh, do like actual drugs because, oh, I could I could get so addicted so quickly. I I don't even drink. Um, and we got an execute. Who I'm naming you, Q W E twenty six twenty three. What the fuck does that mean? I do not know. So. So, I guess, uh, well, I think I'm going to... Well, what do you mean, encoding overload? I don't know what triggers that is the thing. What triggers it briefly getting laggy in the recording. Like, I'm doing the same setup, but whatever. Whatever. This is uh, on my Homestuck Epilogues video. Because uh, I named Pokemon after comments. The twist at that time code. I checked it. It's what I assumed it would be. That's uh, the point in the epilogues video. Where uh, the big twist of candy comes. Or I don't even know if it counts as a big twist. Uh, just the moment where it is fully established. That John is uh, completely full of shit. And Roxy is sentient. And not an NPC. And like John is just full of shit. Like. Really good scene. I think that's the best scene in Candy. It's really well done. This reveal that John has just been this incredibly unreliable source of information. And that all of his beliefs are in his head. Uh, the twist completely blindsided me. I guess mostly because my memory of the prologue was so foggy. I In this comment you keep calling it the epilogues, the prologue. And like the title of the video is the Homestuck epilogues. And oh, whatever. Although it's kind of a prologue to Beyond Canon, although it's much better than Beyond Canon. Uh, beyond feeling disgusted by the character shifts, I was mostly confused what the story was trying to stay, say, especially John, the John arc in Candy, which, if you were kind to me, was to say I don't agree with him, but in reality, it was just because I didn't know what the hell he was talking about. I thought your description made sense until suddenly didn't. The only specific scene I can remember reading is the one where things happen in the car. And I only remember thinking it came totally out of left field. It's nice to think that it was at least temporarily cathartic for Terezi. And that in that sense, even if John was being crazy, I like the Terezi-John relationship from the original comic. God, run on sentences. Seemed to basically stay the same in the prologues. Uh, there's a rival fight coming up. So yeah, I do think that's, like, John, like, telling Terezi uh, that he loves her in... Oh, wait, is it at the end that uh, Silver shows up? John, in me, telling Terezi that he loves her kind of comes out of 
uh, left field. I, I do agree with Dirk in making fun of John. Like, pfft, you don't. You're just, you got bad because you fucked in your dad's car. You fucking loser. Like, but Terezi, Terezi, I think Terezi genuinely loves John. Oh, so it's that specific tile, that's weird. I think Trezzy loves John, just not that John, and she doesn't know that they're different. And then in Beyond Canon, like, the current state in Beyond Canon is that uh, Trezzy is working with Dirk, planning to betray him and revive John. And also, Dirk is fully aware that she is going to betray him. And in the most recent update, it's just like, fuck, try it, try it. I... I'm God, capital G God. I will erase you from existence if you try and betray me. So I'm curious to see how that uh, winds up. Um, uh, where were you? Uh, maybe that's why John felt like Trezzy was the only one who was real. Actually, wait, you're giving good explanations right now. Um, she never changed because she never gave up looking for Vriska. She was the only one who didn't grow into a different person because she lived in denial for, in denial for so long. Shit, I'm stealing that when I do a Terezi video. And in that sense, she was the only one John could still recognize. Shit, that's good. It adds to what I said before, the terrifying rea reality of the plot line of a piece of media that continues even when the reader stops reading. Yeah, that is a... I'm going to jump off. I'll go back to what you're saying in a minute. I do love uh, when... Because when I edit videos, uh, something, I have a, like, I go through a few things. I, uh, while I've been uh, editing my latest YouTube video, I've been re-watching the Quentin Reviews stuff. And I do love, because uh, I never watched Sam and Cat, but the Quentin Reviews video uh, informed me of this. That Sam and Cat, the final episode of that show, ends with Ariana Grande's character, Cat Valentine, going to jail for assaulting a child. She, it's a contest where Dice is up against another kid in a modeling thing or something, and Cat decides to help Dice win by just tackling some random 10-year-old to the ground and ripping his hair out, and at the end, she calls Sam and is like, hey, can you bail me out? And Sam says no. So that, that's how that show fucking ends. That character's never appearing again in any media. So the official end for Cat Valentine, the character is in jail because she beat the shit out of a kid. Bravo. Bravo. There isn't... And also something uh, Quinn Reviews points out in that video is that... the Because la... Noah Monk doesn't want anything to do with Ike Carly anymore. The last time we see his character, it's heavily implied that he's going to get murdered by Neville, who is now Hannibal Lecter. That's just... That's uh, fun. Um, but yeah, characters continue after the story ends, and that's something that Homestuck... Uh, the epilogues touch on. In the limbo state the characters found themselves in, when you leave the plot line, you end up with characters either like John and Terezi experiencing, experiencing total stagnation and being completely flawed while losing all of their friends who have moved on, or like every other character who grow up into being something else you can no longer recognize. Neither outcome seems enjoyable to me in the same way I like the original run of Homestuck. It's certainly interesting, but forcing characters in Homestuck, it's like a spin-off that happens when you take the Homestuck characters and put them into a world with totally new rules and challenges to face, which can be a hard sell to people like me who just enjoy the character arcs as they completed originally. But if you like the medical metatextual stuff, which I do, I can imagine how enjoyable it will be. Yeah, I don't fault anyone for disliking the epilogues. They're a very niche story. Like, my whole point in that was not that you should like the epilogues and that's wrong to dislike them, it's that I didn't like the discourse on the epilogues, where uh, they aren't really, the discourse isn't really about the epilogues themselves, it isn't engaging them on this level, like, um, what you're, what QWE is saying, um, that uh, the epilogues talk about uh, characters changing or stagnating, that's really interesting, that's a big part of the epilogues, if you're I don't like that uh, plot line, but I do acknowledge that's what it's about. That's so much better than Andrew Hussey wrote something that was bad because Andrew Hussey uh, uh, wanted to write something. Because, no, that's just fucking bullshit. Um, 
I only wish it could have been done with totally new, non-Homestuck characters, and I get that, but it couldn't have been. It had to be Homestuck characters, because otherwise who would give a shit? But obviously, it would be totally impossible to accomplish. I think probably, I probably have to give the prologues another chance. It's been five goddamn years after all. I was 16 when I first read them. Oof! To be fair, I was 14 when I first read Homestuck. And I was 16 when it ended. Um... And then recommending the Beginner's Guide, which I haven't played, but I've heard about. It's Isn't it by the same guy who made uh, the Stanley Parable? And the idea is uh, that the narrator is going through games made by a friend of his and, like, providing a director's commentary, except uh, he isn't the director. He doesn't actually know, and he's full of himself. Like, I saw a video essay on it once. Was it a Jacob Geller video or someone else? I don't know. You could say that John's argument that everyone is fake is a way of looking at the epilogues from the perspective of someone who only enjoyed the original. It recontextualizes all those problems as a sort of continuation from the past, with Terezi as a connection to it, as an existential abstract challenge to be overcome, rather than the first world problems he's really been avoiding. Only the... Only that John resorts to apathy rather than solving the problem, which I guess is the way most of the prologue haters have addressed it. Yeah, I agree with that. And wow, that is so consistent. That is calling it the prologues. It's it's in the video title, man. You wa you watched the video. I said the word epilogues a lot. Ugh. I'd like to get through all of this Team Rocket stuff today. So updates on how the channel's going. I've been I've started writing simultaneously my next three video essays first off uh the stone ocean one won the poll i'm doing a video on stone oceans ending uh writing that's going good it's gonna be a good video about just i really love stone actually i think stone ocean is better as like what i'm going to do a video essay talking about the really good moments because stone ocean it's a very Flawed, very messy story. Has a lot of pacing problems. A lot of pop points that are kind of dumb. But, like, when Stone Ocean is good, it is the absolute best part in all of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, I truly believe. Stone Ocean, at its best, is incredible. It's up there uh, with Steel Ball Run, I would say, when Stone Ocean is at its best. And it's kind of messy getting there, but I like things that are messy. Like, I... I'm very much a fan of this is messy, but it takes a big swing. I like that more than it's safe, but it's safe and kind of boring, but competent throughout. I like things that are messy. Huh. And um, after that, there's my mini series on the politics of Batman, which I was going to call it the politics of Batman. I think I'm going to change the di the title to... Is Batman a fascist question mark? Because I do think... I mean, that's the core question I'm going to be trying to answer in this mini-series. And I also think I'm going to do six parts instead of five. But the first part will be short. And it will come out like a day before the second part. The first part is... Hey, some thunder. The first part's going to be a sort of introduction where I'm going to uh, talk about why I'm doing the project. Uh... Like, the Al Moore interview that inspired it. I'm going to actually define fascism and the definition I'm going to be using throughout the rest of the project, which is uh, Umberto Eco's uh, prin pillars or principles or some er fascism. That's the essay. I don't remember if it calls it principles or pillars or signs of fascism, whatever. Where he lists out, like, all of these ideas that fascism has. And honestly, it's hard to define fascism. It's a lot... I'm gonna get so much shit for that video, because I'm going... Fascism. It's pronounced fascism. Not fascism. Fascism. Is that an Italian... It's an Italian word. I'm pretty sure it's fascism. But every time I say fascism in a video, I get people commenting, uh, why are you saying fascism? I... I've heard both pronounced. I don't know what's correct. Uh, whatever, whatever. The point is, um, I had a point. Um, I'm going to define what fascism is in that video, and 
that is a concept that is kind of hard to define, both because of for political reasons, people just define whatever they don't like as fascism, which isn't true, but also, um, it's a really complex thing, and like the best uh, definitions, like Echo's definition from Urfascism, which is what I'm using as the definition in that video, is just basically, okay, uh, if it has a lot of these qualities, it's probably fascist. Um, it's just like, you know, if you see a lot of these things, you can call it fascist. If you don't see any of them, definitely not fascist. If it's just a few of them, eh, it's kind of the it. It's just, I don't know, it's a complicated topic. But to be fair, to be fair, a lot of, like, the signs of fascism, like, they go together and they compound on each other. So... It can still be fascist if it's missing one or two of them, but it's more likely to have a lot of them uh, together uh, because they go together. Like, um, this worship of machismo and the military, that's one of the core parts of fascism, according to Ur-Fascism. And also, this hatred of the weak and the disabled. Well, those go hand in hand. The worship of the strong, the hatred of the weak, and, of course, the, the enemy is both... Strong and weak, that's another one of the more famous aspects of fascism from that essay. Well, yeah, defining your enemy as weak, that goes hand in hand with uh, contempt for the weak. Like, it all comes together. And the reason why I'm splitting off uh, the defining fascism part is because otherwise it's going to be weird to talk about this essay uh, on what it means to be a fascist. And then talking about um, a Batman work that doesn't feature Batman being that, because the first, um, well, the second part is going to feature me talking, me talking heavily, heavily about Batman the Animated Series, which I think is the gold standard for how Batman behaves, and Batman's not a fascist in that show specifically. He is borderline in a few of the other things I'm going to be talking about, and there is one version of Batman that is just, Batman is a fascist under this one specific writer's pen. And, like, if you have seen uh, previous uh, videos where I've talked about, like, you, it's not hard to figure out which writer I'm vaguing about when I say that there's a Batman writer who I think is a fascist, and I think his version of Batman is a diehard fascist. Um, but, yeah, yeah, I'm working hard on those, and I've started rewatching a Batman the Animated Series. Just going to go through all 100, was 120 episodes, um, if you include, like, the new Batman and Adventures, and the new Adventures of Batman and Robin. <laughs> Wait, there was an item there. I want the item. I want the item. 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 Um, yeah, so that's going to be a long time, going through all of uh, those episodes of the Batman. But not the Batman. That's a different thing. But, you know, Batman series that is animated. And I'm, so far, I've watched the first three episodes and written uh, up on two of them. And, I mean, to be fair, there are a lot of episodes where there's a ton I can talk about. Like, the Poison Ivy episodes, I'm going to have a lot to talk about. Uh, the episode Lockup, going to have so much to talk about. I got nothing for uh, the most recent episode I watched, which is Cri Christmas for the Joker, because it's just... There's this clown dude, and he breaks out of the asylum, and he throws a pie in Batman's face. I, I can't talk too much about that episode. And the real thing, it isn't... I don't want to analyze every single episode of that show in depth. It's just the overarching themes. And honestly, honestly, uh, going to, to the show with the framework of this project, and the thing I'm going to hammer home is, uh, I think, the thing that really defines... Uh, whether or not Batman is a fascist in these various... Why did I go to the roof? Like, one of the defining things uh, that determines whether or not Batman is a fascist, it's not... is whether or not he kills. And obviously, killing people is n not necessarily the same thing as being a fascist, although fascists do very much like killing people. But I think... I think how Batman views... Uh, the mentally ill and the people he fights is a very big, it's the biggest sign of how that Batman is. So, like, uh, I think 
there's a big difference in whether or not this character is vaguely fascist between, uh, say, Batman the Animated Series constantly, constantly, like, with Babyface, Clayface, um, Man Bat, like, I want to help you, you're a person, versus, uh, say, Tim Burton Batman, where it's like, the criminals are not human, I must mow them down from my plane because they are not human beings, I don't believe in rehabilitation, I just believe in superior firepower. And, like, the worst version of Batman is that to the T, where it's just, where it takes a step from, these criminals are not people and they must be exterminated, to, by the way, when I talk about criminals, I mean the specific ethnic group which I, the author of this book, think must be exterminated for the glory of the white race. Ah, uh, there is a... I really don't like one Batman writer in particular, and I don't... I'm being vague about it, but... I mean, it's obvious. I've talked... Like, in the last time I talked about Batman, I said, I'm gonna talk about this writer more in the future, because I fucking hate this writer. Like, it's not hard to uh, understand who I'm talking about. And let me just uh, update you, because I added a graveler. Yay! But yeah, I'm going to continue uh, watching through Batman, the animated series, writing it up. Uh, what does this guy lead with? He leads with a gold bat. Okay. Wait, there's... Hold on. There's a rematch against Petrol? No. Oh, that's bad. Or did I already do Petrol? He's he's the one who killed my Nido Queen, right? They don't make you fight him twice in the same, like, mini dungeon, do they? Because that would be BS. Ah. I'm just looking at Bulbapedia. So yeah, I'm working on that. And uh, what my update today, what my upload today for this Saturday is um, the second part of my latest batch of D&D stories. And um, I'm trying something different for this season of D&D stories where I'm going from just the stock images and kind of crappy style to trying to do something more serious and more, I guess, professional. Um, it's still very, very rough, basically a slideshow, but of backgrounds and then um, Hero Forge tokens with the background uh, removed for all the characters and having them move around in close-ups when they're talking. And I don't know... I like the style. I don't know how people are going to like it, but I like it. And this one was... Kind of iffy. There's a few very funny moments uh, in this uh, second episode of this, but it's a lot of setting up the campaign, introducing the player characters and the antagonists and the ongoing plot lines. Okay, so it's just... Okay, good. I don't have to rematch Petrol. And uh, Silver's mom leads with an Arbok, who uh, I guess I'll use Heracross for... Sure, and then after her, it's going to be Archer, who has his Hound Doom, which is high level, and uh, Gyarados, I mean, Gyarados has Surf, but it's a weak move, because Gyarados doesn't have good stats. And the other thing uh, that I've been working on lately is uh, my RPG, which I've been working on on again, off again, for like two fucking years, I just... I'm getting it done in May. I don't care. I'm getting that shit done in May. I'm, like, very close to being done. Just so close. I need to write the ending to it, and I need to implement that writing, and I'm going to try and do that for next time, next week, and, hmm. Hmm. I think I'm going to keep both Brick Break and um, Close Combat, and here's my reasoning. Because uh, Brick Break doesn't have downsides and has more power points. That, that's the reason. Um, yeah, and so I'm working on that. And also, I'm trying to do two comments per video. So let's do, again, like, other people are better at uh, understanding Homestuck than me. The guy who's made, like, five out four four and a half hours of homestuck video essays um like for instance i saw on tumblr the other day i don't remember who posted this i'm af afraid but um someone just pointing out that in meat they lost the heir of breath who's had powers over freedom 
and thus they lost their freedom. In Candy, they lost the Prince of Heart, who heart is the element of the sense of self, and thus they became distorted and strange. Like, goddamn, I wish I had picked up on that. This is, ah, uh, this is such a deep, complicated comic. Or maybe it's just staring at pictures of Joe Biden. I'm eating sandwiches and, oh wait, I'm showing, uh, I shouldn't show that because I'm focusing on the comic, but I had to check to see what he led with. Um, Cabinet Gremlin, which is a dope-ass name. The foreshadowing of the unbreakable katana being broken was always one of my favorite details in Homestuck. I liked it so much I made a video essay on it. It had been set up for a while and showcased already after the retcon. That exact duplicate, see, I never picked up on this, but you can only have one version of P of things in one universe. So one of them has to be dis destined to die or destroyed. And um, uh, Dirk's sword got brought to the game over timeline. That's smart because... Well, actually... Actually, no, that does track. That does track because it was um, buried uh, with... Uh, the beta version of Dirk's corpse and then Roxy pulls it out which is just like so Dave could have just pulled it out but he didn't he didn't think to do that he thought to break it um, but yeah the sword can be broken now um, because it can be broken now because there's a second version of it um, and that's part of it uh, part of it I feel like is because uh, Caldfulch is designed uh, to break through anything because it's amplified by the cue ball. And I guess that's specific to Lord English, but I do think that part of it is just that uh, Cowled Fulch in general is good at breaking. And also is because it's Dave Climactic moment where he's doing the impossible. He's finally being his brother. Uh, Clyde is full of stuff like this with my se second favorite realization being that since looking into Cal's eyes is very bad, uh, only P people with some kind of eye protection were allowed by the Alpha timeline to even enter the fight with the Jacks. Dave and Dirk wear sunglasses. Spade has a robot eye. Trezzy is blind. Um, maybe? Because Dirk... I don't... Th Does Dirk ever, ever take off his sunglasses? Dirk doesn't take off his sunglasses. Um, but he gets possessed by a low cow. Like... He's very clear. Like, look at those uh, saw things he makes. Like, um, he... Shut up, old man. I'm talking. I don't... Well, maybe he... I mean, it takes like 30 years for him to become the Dirk we see who abuses Dave. So maybe, like, con contrast that to, to just briefly uh, staring into the eyes of Lil' Cal, which is what made Jack go off the deep end. So maybe the sunglasses dampened it and reduced the effect for Dirk. I don't know. I actually ran back up the stairs. But I think that's how uh, this episode is going to end. Uh, next couple weeks are going to be more just working on Day of Apotheosis and then another D&D story. But in June, we're getting the Stone Ocean video, probably another D&D story. Maybe comedy skit if I get a good idea. Don't know why I'm doing in July. Probably another D&D &D story. I'm trying to do those about once a month, maybe twice a month, because I want to have it done by the end of the year. And then in August, we're getting our Batman videos. Until then, uh, my name has been Casey Jarms, and that's all you need. And that's all you need. And um, see, it's not stealing something if I fuck up saying it.